Good evening, everyone. Um, Easton Wings of Hope would like to welcome all the guests to tonight's panel discussion on youth substance use and prevention. Um, recognizes, uh, Easton Wings of Hope is recognized as the Youth Substance Use and Prevention Coalition of the Town of Easton. And um, Easton Wings of Hope envisions a healthy Easton where healthy choices are recognized, valued, and accessible to all. Our mission is to prevent youth substance use through education, awareness, and policy change. Tonight, Eastern Windsor Hope aims to make parents, guardians, and grandparents aware of the root causes and signs of youth substance use disorder and how to prevent it from ever happening to their children. By increasing the community's knowledge on youth substance use disorder and methods of prevention, we can take one more step in ensuring that Eastern's youth will remain healthy for years to come. Um, Eastern Windsor Hope would like to thank uh, Ames Free Library and Creasy House for hosting this event tonight. We also thank Eastern Community Access Television for providing the necessary equipment. Uh, to allow us to film this discussion. Most importantly, we thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to share their experiences and expertise in their respective fields concerning um, the issues of use, substance use, um, and prevention. Following tonight's discussion, we'll field questions from the audience. We've provided pens and post-it notes so the questions may be written down while um, the participants, participants provide their response. Um, so I'm just going to introduce myself because I'll be asking you questions tonight. My name is Polly Letts. Um, and I'm on the steering committee for Eastern Windsor Hope, and I have been since it was founded in 2015. Um, and what I'd like to do is, first of all, just ask all of you to introduce yourselves to the folks who are here today and, and for the folks who may be watching later on or at home today. I'm Dr. Aaron Bornstein. I'm with Middleborough Pediatrics. I've uh, been a practicing pediatrician for 17 years with Middleborough Pediatrics now for 13 years. Officer Taylor. Yes, um, uh, my name is Patrick Taylor, I'm a police officer, uh, prosecutor for the Eastern Police Department. I've been a police officer for 33 years. Um, I started back in 1986 for the town of Braintree. After the town of Braintree, I moved to the Northeastern University where I became a campus police officer and an uh, emergency medical technician. Further to uh, the MBTA where I worked in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, and six at night till two in the morning, impact shift. Uh, saw a lot of interesting, uh, serious crime there. And 25 years ago, I lateral transferred to the town of Easton, where I started the town's first canine unit. And uh, here I sit before you tonight, uh, 25 years later, as uh, a few years away from retirement, uh, as the police prosecutor and the firearms licensing officer for the town. Thank you. Hi, I'm Evan Malone. Um, I'm a captain at the Easton Fire Department. Um, and more specifically, I am the EMS coordinator, the emergency uh, medical services coordinator, which means I'm responsible for ensuring that the ambulance service um, for the town runs uh, as efficiently as it can. Um, I've been a paramedic for 24 years, um, and uh, the the uh, other roles I have is uh, being a shift officer, meaning I actually run, I work, uh, I don't work days, I work out on a shift um, running a group of firefighters. Hi, I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the founder of Elevate Counseling Services. I'm a licensed mental health counselor, and I um, landed my first job in substance abuse in 2001 for a DPH grant uh, that was treating substance abuse uh, patients who were having DUIs and needed psychoeducation and sub sub some support around getting into recovery. Um, we now have three uh, practices. We have one in Bellingham, our main office in Southeastern and also in Middleborough. And we have plans to um, open an addiction treatment center, um, hopefully uh, within two years um, in Brockton. So we're really uh, passionate about treating addiction and taking care of the people in the communities that we serve. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Joyce from the Old Colony YMCA. I'm the Vice President of Grants and Contracts at the Y. I've been there for 16 years, uh, but the first 15 years of my career at the Y were with, with our juvenile justice programs and families experiencing homelessness and uh, working with everyone from ages 0 to 18. Hi, I'm Marcy Decamara. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I'm, I am the owner of the Inspired Counseling, which we opened in 2015. I've been in the field since 2003. I have worked um, with all ages in substance use, mental health, and I wrote the curriculum for the adolescent outpatient day treatment program that's now used by the state. Thank you very much. Um, the first question is going to be directed to Marcy, Leanne, and uh, Aaron. Um, 
and you can, in, in no particular <coughs> order, um, what are you currently finding to be some of the root causes of youth substance use, and, and what are the possible signs of abuse? So I'll, I'll throw it out there, and whoever wants to. I can start. Sure. Um, so fundamentally, the root cause is the thing that's always been is that youth are novelty seeking. I mean, they're always looking for new things to do and try. Some are good decisions, some are bad decisions. So to some extent, you know, the, the real question is what has changed and what has it? Because the kids have not changed, but the surrounding environment around the kids has changed. Um, so the, the issues currently, I would say, that are the biggest issues for what we're seeing um, have to do with a few things. There's, one is most kids don't develop substance use disorders. So most kids who experiment with something don't go on to have substance problems. But, what, <clears throat> but the other flip side of that is that there's a misperception that most kids use drugs, and that is not true either. So from a trial perspective, like kids who experiment with drugs, um, the things that root causes have to do a lot with opportunity and access. Um, we're seeing this most right now with vaping and the accessibility for electronic cigarettes, which are easily concealable. So that is a huge epidemic right now, and the FDA is all over that. And But it's estimated that at least no, high 40s to low 50% of middle schoolers and high schoolers have had exposure to that. Um, so opportunity and access is a big part of it. Um, there's obviously a big concern with marijuana becoming legal in the state about what that means, and we're already seeing that because of, again, concealable forms of marijuana. This is not simply smoking anymore. This is now vaping it in, in a concealable device. Um, there is also some misperceptions about safety, and again, especially around those two um, items. There, there's a misperception, even amongst the adults, I think, about what is normal and what's safe, um, and that kids pick up on that uh, quite right away. So from a trial standpoint, that's a piece of it. And then from you know, that percentage of kids who tries and goes into a disorder, um, there are several risk factors. Um, the biggest one I would say is the potency of what's being used. Um, you know, a Juul device is 20 cigarettes worth of nicotine in one, one hit. Um, so the drug always, the drug picks the child, the child's not picked the drug. Uh, I've spoken to some, my sister teaches seventh grade, we talked to students, the first question I always ask is, what do you want to be when you grow up? They say teachers, policemen, firemen, whatever. None of them ever say a drug addict. Um, then I ask them, who wants to be a drug addict? No one chooses that, because no one chooses uh, a dependency problem. But the potency of the drugs has changed. So the marijuana has changed, the nicotine products have changed, um, and that's a big, a big shift in terms of the risk of going into a disorder. Certainly the opiate availability has changed um, with people keeping medicines in their home. Um, so that's been a big problem as well. Um, and then the other thing is access. So you know, when we were growing up, we didn't have the internet and we didn't have the opportunity to go online and order this stuff. And you know, I've had two weeks ago, I had a parent come over with all this paraphernalia they'd never seen before that the child had ordered online. But some of it were actual um, liquid extracts of marijuana and other sorts of things. Um, and these are all <coughs> accessible online now, before you'd have to find someone who could sell it to you. Um, so those, I think, are the biggest changes for that kids are facing now and, and puts them at greater risk now of a dependency problem that we had when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to speak to the root causes of mm -hmm. substance use? Okay. Well, I would like to say that, you know, the, the longer we can put off that experimental, right, the, the more we can hold off um, from our young people experimenting with vaping or marijuana or drinking a beer or whatnot, the better chance that that child has of not getting into an addiction, right? So I think that's important. So the hope here is in prevention, mm -hmm. making sure that we're keeping our kids safe, occupied, um, I like to say uh, living in their strengths, right? So if they're into music, make sure that they're learning an instrument. If they enjoy gaming, get them involved in a club, right? You want to make sure they're engaged in finding those experiences, those new experiences in life that really are fulfilling and keep them busy and keep their minds growing and challenged and creating new synapses that make that their lives feel exciting and interesting and vibrant, encouraging healthy relationships. Um, an article I read that was a 
game changer as a mom. My kids all successfully made it into their 20s, so I'm thrilled. Um, was I got to pick my kids' friends, right? Until they are 14 years old, we get to pick their friends. And that, I think, is one of the key prevention pieces. It's okay to say to our young people, you know, a friend doesn't really make you feel that way. Or I'm really concerned about some of these conversations that I'm hearing or right. And so I think that's an important prevention piece as well to speak into your child's life for as long as you possibly can so that by the time they're 14, 15, they know what it feels like to have a, a positive internal experience where they're engaged in life, they're engaged with people, they understand um, how to make good choices for themselves that they're going to have that intrinsic reward for, right? I think that's very important. So the longer we can put off those parties, the longer, you know, ultimately they're going to go to college, they're going to try some stuff, right? Maybe sooner, but hopefully not. Um, so I think that's a really important aspect of the prevention piece. One last thing I'll say, one word, anxiety. Anxiety. So um, I believe that that is a core reason so many of our young people are seeking to alter their state of consciousness in the world they are self-medicating anxiety. I mean, if there's one diagnosis that Elevate Counseling has flourished because of its social anxiety, its generalized anxiety, its you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's because of the social media and how large the world has gotten and how overwhelmed our young people are. You know, my husband and I did, um, Bye Bye Birdie, is that the, the, the musical with Charlene Ha and that song, What's the Matter with Kids Today, right? Loved that, I was the old lady with the gray wig, right? Well, you know, it's what's the matter with the world today. It's squeezing our kids and they really are struggling with just being. And I think that we need to acknowledge that and we need to recognize that and not pretend that our children are living in the same world that we mm -hmm. were living in, because they're not. And I think that's really important to normalize their pain and help them be their best selves in the midst of that. I think the third person to answer the question is never the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was going to talk about a lot about is the self-medication piece and the link to mental health because the stigma for our teenagers with the mental health link is so huge. We've got a lot of parents who are very supportive of our kids seeking mental health treatment and are really embracing that and getting helping them to get the tools. And we have a lot of parents who are still saying, not my kid, because it's not something that they're comfortable with because it was taboo when we were younger and we didn't go to therapy. It wasn't as normalized as it is now. There weren't the support systems in the school that there is now. So our teens are turning to marijuana, to vaping, to alcohol, to whatever they can get their hands on to try to feel better. Some of them are doing it in conjunction with sports. Thankfully, you know, sports has a lot of big um, consequences for kids who are found using. A lot of towns use the 40% rule where you can't participate in 40% of the, the rest of the game. So I know that's a, a large deterrent for kids. but. It's the self-medication piece. It's the kids who the parents have medication for whatever their reasons are, whether it's coming out of surgery and they're trying things on their medicine cabinet. And it's not just the opiates that we're seeing, but it's still, it's still the cough medicine, the over-the-counter things that they can get. So the accessibility around that, combined with trying to reduce the stigma and how they're feeling, is what I'm seeing for a lot of kids, in addition to absolutely tons of anxiety um, or the depressive piece but it's more coming out of just wanting to feel better and not wanting to feel awkward in school. So that's what I'm seeing a lot of. I'm gonna add one more thing and going on to you. There, there's a neurobiological thing, that point that needs to be made, which is what you're saying, is that the younger the brain is that exposed mm -hmm. to this, the greater the risk. You know, cigarette companies <coughs> knew this long ago, that if you give a letter and 12 year old one or two cigarettes, they have an extremely high chance of being a lifelong smoker. So. Part of the challenge also is getting parents to understand you have to have a discussion early 
So like some of the earliest substances that are used are inhalants, you know, everything, cleaners and products around your house. So you know, we try to have that talk starting at ages eight to 10 about what kids get access to and what they try, sometimes out of just innocent experimentation. Um, and parents are often mortified to think that you have to have that conversation early. But the seeds are, are sown early on. Um, you develop resiliency skills early on to try to suddenly implant all those skills and implant all that knowledge at age 14 is not that effective. Um, so you know, it is really critical that the curriculum and the schools and the conversations in our office and the conversations at home around risk-taking behaviors so much earlier than what most people think they have to. And if I could add on to that, it's important that they're coming from the parents because they're hearing it from their peers at school. And the education from their peers is not necessarily what we as parents would want our children to hear because they're hearing it on the bus, they're hearing it from their friends, older siblings, and it's getting very misconstrued often at times. When, when I drove down the highway today, I saw the big sign saying marijuana is legal, learn about it. It's just... Yeah, not right. It's a little message. more fun. Yeah, my, yeah. my kids are 14 and 11 and they're in the back of the car and they just see this, but there's nothing there that speaks to risk mm -hmm. or what it's for. Right. It's just saying, I want you to know more about it. And you know, obviously it's the industry that's encouraging that, but you know, if you, as a parent, don't have a conversation about what that sign's trying to do, mm -hmm. if you don't do a little media literacy with your kids to try to parse out the messaging, understanding that kids when they're young are cognitively defenseless against advertising, then, then you run risks that as a parent, you're, you're being overwhelmed by messaging from other sources. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not a panelist, but the, the billboard, the, well, the billboard yeah. thing, we were coming back from a college visit and we saw a, a, one, one of the marijuana, it was the yeah. western part of the state, marijuana billboard, and not two seconds later was a billboard for um, mm -hmm. substance abuse treatment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, we hadn't gone two seconds because we were driving, you know, and I, and I was, we all kind of looked at it and were a little struck by the juxtaposition of those two messages, but you're absolutely right, it's, you know, it's, it's everywhere. So, sorry, I need to jump in on that, but, um, so Katie, this, the next question is for you. If someone who has um, extensive experience in youth development, can you give us a quick overview of sort of positive youth development strategies and how they can help um, to prevent um, youth substance use? Yeah, a couple of them were already mentioned by some of the panelists, um, but exactly what um, Dr. Bornstein was just saying, we're all caring adults, you guys are all here because you're caring adults either of children or people within the community, um, and all youth development should be positive, um, but it takes time and consistent messages to make sure that kids are getting that information. Um, one of the things that we incorporate into all of our programs at the Y um, is from the Search Institute. It's called Developmental Assets. Um, and those are 40 things that kids need to grow up and thrive and be successful. Um, and they don't just need it when they become adolescents. They need it from the moment you start caring for them. Um, and there's different ways that you do that, obviously, from you know a toddler's age to an eight-year-old to a 15-year-old. but. Um, it takes time and um, you know it, it has to be consistent um, so these are all some examples are um, positive family communication safety planning and decision making um, peaceful conflict resolution restraint responsibility there's I brought some lists with me if people want to talk after um, but they're all critical to kids making good decisions um, and to um, you know, back to those friend relationships, peer relationships. Um, I would say that that is something that hasn't changed over the years, that uh, caring adults and adult role models are still what we needed when we were growing up and kids still need them today, probably now more than ever. Um, it's extremely important. Um, and the more caring adults and the more of these assets that kids have, the less likely they are to engage in some of these negative behaviors. There's 25 years of research behind this, six million kids. The U.S., 30 other countries, <laughs> there's um, lots of different resources. So it's well studied, evidence based, um, and it's critical to kids growing up well. Those are those lists available for? Yeah, they have. For, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everyone wants to say. Thank you very much. Does anybody want to weigh in? 
Okay, so the next question actually is for um, Evan and Patrick. So based upon your experience with the Eastern Fire Department and the Eastern Police Department, um, what do you think is important for parents, guardians, and grandparents to understand about substance use and prevention by our youth? Yeah, I'll start. Um, first, and I'd just say that um, being an emergency service, first responder, um, we're not so involved in the prevention and we kind of see the um, end result of either a life of substance abuse or when we're in a crisis mode. I mean, we, um, we're called when a person can no longer function or there's a reason that they need to be hospitalized. Um, so again, we see it from a different perspective, um, not so much the prevent, uh, prevention side. Um, so we see the, we, we do see, however, how um, a life of abuse affects the individual, the family, the community. Um, the workplace. Um, so I guess what's important, I think, for parents to know that it's, I don't know that it's research-based or not, but my experience shows that um, substance abuse evolves. We see the same people over and over, worsening and worsening until it's a situation where they can no longer function. Um, and it's not specific to a location or population. In fact, um, one of my roles here is keeping statistics, medical um, statistics for ambulance transports in our town. And year to year, it's, uh, it, it stays uh, the same. It's about 15% of our transports are substance abuse related or psychiatric or combined. Um, and I think it's interesting you talked about the anxiety. I, um, through 25 years, again, of being in an ambulance as a paramedic, I see the two go hand in hand. Um, psychiatric disorders and substance abuse almost often uh, the, the person who uh, is in a crisis mode where they're being taken to the hospital also has a history of depression or anxiety or um, bipolar manic depressive so I thought that was interesting that my experience um, you know bore out the what is what right. actually is going on mm -hmm. um, yeah so I guess that that's what I, I would I think um, it's important for parents I wonder that the um, the diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder I've always thought um, and Dr. May, if you may jump in on it, if a, a diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder in a, in a youth may heighten the risk of them um, becoming uh, addicted to substances, and maybe it would be you, know, you can more focus on, on a substance abuse prevention for those, um, those children that are diagnosed at a young age with these disorders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, I think there are, there are clearly risk factors for using and experimenting with drugs as you get into adolescence, and behavioral disorders, mental health disorders, uh, ADHD would be all included in that. Um, you know, what's interesting, if you look at ADHD, for instance, I tell this to all my parents, I'm like, when I'm looking at the six-year-old with ADHD, I'm like, my goal is not to necessarily make your kids sit in a seat at age six in first grade. My goal is to have him be a successful student when he enters high school, so he doesn't run the risk of substance abuse, school dropout, poor relationships, car accidents, all the rest of it because it's excellent data when a child with ADHD, for instance, is well treated that their risk is no greater than the general population for substance problems. Um, so early intervention is key with all this. Uh, what's hard to undo is poor self-esteem, poor decision making, poor peer groups. Um, that's hard to undo. So what you're trying to do is when you find kids who are at risk, be it the family situation, be it intrinsic uh, issues with the kid, is to try to find what those resiliency factors are that you can build up around the kids. So every kid needs a compelling adult in their life. It doesn't necessarily need to be a parent. It could be a coach, it could be a teacher, it could be anyone. Um, and to what you were saying, every kid should have what we like to describe as an island of competency, right? So you may not be the best student, you may not even be a very good student at all, but if you love art, we need to push the art. Um, and this is actually one of my issues, quite frankly, with the athletics when the kid gets kicked off the team, when the only thing they have going in their life is baseball, mm. and you take that one thing away from them, there's nothing to do but to retreat even worse into the drugs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we try to lobby to say, listen, removing them from the one thing that they're successful at, that's one positive aspect in their life, is not going to make the problem better, it's going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of, you know, sense of punishment generally doesn't, is not effective for the kids. So, you know, the interventions need to be around that early, and you're 100% you're right, there was Problem is, and it's true in families too. When you see someone who's at the beginning stages of a problem, it's very different about what the opportunity is to uh, intervene at that point than when something hits crisis mode. Uh, then, then it becomes a lot more difficult. Officer Taylor, do you want to add? Yeah, actually, uh, it, just a little personal observation. Something that I've noticed over the years. Um, I, I would. It's, it's easier said than done, but it's very important 
to stay, as we've already spoken about, uh, as an active participant in your child's life. You don't just let your kid go to school, come home, stay in their room, and do whatever they want to do and bring them up for supper, and, and that's about the only interaction you have with them because they're going to get involved with it. They're going to pay attention to their friends more than you. They're going to, you know, they're going to get involved in things that are not necessarily uh, you know, good for them. So stay involved. And more importantly, in, in my opinion than that, is, and I'm, this might be uh, contrary to what some of the other panel might believe, it's not, a, it's not, I'm not trying to blame people, but stop protecting your children the way that I've noticed it's going on. I brought up my, uh, my background uh, being an MBTA police officer. So 25 years ago, I was working in the city of Boston. I transferred here to Easton. When I first came here, I noticed there was a huge alcohol issue with kids. I said, so I traded stabbings and shootings for kids drinking at the end of cul-de-sacs and running through the woods and having house parties while the parents were in New Hampshire. <laughs> to be honest with you, that's kind of how it was. So what I would do is I would, whether it's, I would gather a whole bunch of paraphernalia, whether it be bongs, weed, bottles, of, you know, 30 packs of beer, I would gather all this uh, evidence. I would bring it back to the station. And I wouldn't want to lock the kids up in a restaurant, but I would want to show the parents what their kids are involved with. And I would bring them into the station. I'd have the whole table set up and I'd bring the parents in. And they were mortified, and they would uh, take corrective action with their kid. Sometimes their kid would leave uh, with their tipsy toes because the father's got them by the scruff of the neck. That was, that's how it used to be. Over the years, when I was doing that, I watched the whole cultural shift change. And then the parents stopped doing that. And, I, and when I would say, this is what I found in the back seat of your son's car, the parent would then stand in front of the child and say, what are you doing in my son's car? And they become overly protective, and they become like a goaltender for the child. And if you ask a teacher, a firefighter, a policeman, again, not trying to cast blame, but I, I gotta tell you, over the years, of, this, is, this is 33 years of observing this, front lines, living rooms, in the woods, in attics, in basements, in bathrooms, in people's homes at all hours of the day and night. So I have personal experience of watching the shift in the trend of the way that the parents are protecting the child. Ask any teacher, a fireman, a policeman, judge, you name it. What is the problem with, biggest problem with kids today? And they usually would tell you, it's not the kids, it's the parents. And I think somebody needs to say that on this panel. And again, not trying to cast any blame, don't want to be the black sheep, but I just want to throw that out there, that it needs to be said. We need to take some ownership ourselves as parents. And probably just want to close with this. It, as much as I want to be, you know, I, I, I encourage people to be friend, you know, not, I'm sorry, be involved in their kids' lives. Don't be their friend. You're not there to be their friend. You're there to be their parent. Start acting like it. They have plenty of friends at school. Be a parent. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so this is for um, anybody who wants to jump in in today's uh, fast-paced world. It's often easy to get overwhelmed. We talked about this a little bit. Um, what are some of the ways in which uh, youth can ensure that they uh, make time for self-care, and what are some stress-relieving activities that they can practice? Um, either organized or not, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, right. whatever suggestions you have. I think, oh, sorry. Well, I was going to say, I think that, you know, parents are the primary <coughs> teachers, right, of our kids. So they're going to be watching, you know. Um, I know that when my kids were young, depending on what phase of self care I was in, if I got a little <coughs> irritated with them, mom, I think you should go meditate. Mom, you want to go to the gym? Mom, right? Like, you need to chill out. And they could tell, like, when you take care of yourself and you do things for yourself, then you feel better, you're in a better mood, right? So just as an example, to say that, you know, they're following our lead. So what are they seeing? around them what are they seeing in the home what are they you know they're gonna do the monkey see monkey do thing sort of thing right um and i think that's really important to set that tone um, and be the leader uh, in the home for the children set up scenarios so that they are going out for hikes you know on the weekends you know give them a love of camping or kayaking or whatever it is um, that's going to engage them and help them relax and de-stress and then whatever it is their strength is art music sports giving them opportunities to explore those things that just naturally come to them that can build self-esteem build self-worth um, you know if, if they want to knit or crochet all right let's figure out how to do that let's
just put on a YouTube video and learn how to crochet, right? Like whatever it is, it doesn't really matter as long as they're feeling engaged, mm -hmm. heard, and have opportunities to really um, explore. I think another piece of that is making sure that the kids are engaging it and taking away the social media and the continual locking up in your room and on the, the phones. I hear from a lot of parents, my kids are home when they're in their, their room on the phone. You need to kind of help them come back downstairs and engage and not just allow them to go and sit. And sometimes they are doing great things on their phone. I have a kid who, you know, he likes to do Sudoku puzzles on the phone that helps him focus. He does sometimes watch YouTube videos. There are a lot of great things on the social media, but there's also a lot of not great uses of social media. So really, A, monitoring what your kids are doing, but B, making sure that they are taking time away from just isolating and reminding them that self-care is important. And what can we do? What can you do alone? What can we do as a family? What can I help you do? What are your strengths? What are the things that you want to be doing? What can I model for you? What, what can I bring you to? Blocking yourself in your room all day and watching Netflix all day on a Saturday one movie is a great idea for self-care to decompress, but binge watching all weekend is not. Mm -hmm. So how to, to, how to help them find that balance. Mm -hmm. And I would just add, it goes back to the role modeling piece too, because parents can't be doing things that they don't want their children to be doing. So if you're yeah. using your phone, if you're binge yeah. watching, if you're, whatever, the, you know, they learn from watching you. That's a very old notion, and they, you know, they need to see the role modeling happening as well. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things, um, that we'll still do is family meeting, right? Once a week, he's smiling over there, we would have a family meeting and we would all get together. Um, we had a little question can, an old oatmeal can and the kids decorated and we had like index cards with the pen. Put down your comments, your questions, your concerns, some we screened out and didn't bring, right? But we, they would talk, we would like engage if we were having issues or whatever. We'd plan family vacations during that time. We would dole out chores, whatever. We'd work out any relationship conflicts and we would end it on a good note. A movie, a game night, you know, going for a walk, whatever. And it's a really bonding, connecting type experience. And those are the types of things as a family unit, if you can engage and they feel heard and, and all that, it really goes a long way. Nowadays, if it's a family meeting, it's like, who died? Nope, you gotta come, we'll talk about it when you get here, right? So it's still a tradition that works really well too. And, and you know, traditions is another thing, right? Like when you have the traditions in, within your family unit and their friends engaging with them, it, that, it sounds basic, right? It sounds simple, but it's so real and it's so true. We need connection as human beings and our young people need connection too. And if we're providing them opportunities with good connection, then that's gonna help them. I'm gonna echo a little bit of what you said actually um, in terms of parenting. Um, you know, I, I think one of the challenges parents have right now is uh, this misperception of risk. And especially the misperception that risk is, is bad inherently. That is not true. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have a lot of anxious parents, um, I think more than probably was traditionally the case. Um, and so they just don't, the parents don't let the child take appropriate risk, right? So you go to the, you go to the elementary school playground, the first thing the kid wants to do is like climb on top of the swing set, <laughs> right? Because they're trying to challenge themselves to see what they're capable of doing. Um, and when we take all the risk out of something, then what you've how the kid is that they don't know how to bounce back in the setting of failure and you cannot avoid failure in life mm -hmm. and then what happens is when you get to what you're dealing with is a parent recognizing that child has no way of knowing how to take accountability for an action how to manage emotionally a setback um, how to move past something and take something away from that exactly. and and that's that's the issue you're, you're getting at and that starts early um, so there is something to be said for for when your kids are young, you know, let them let them do some stuff and not, you know, nothing dangerous. And you're not gonna let them play with your ginsu knives. But, but you know, you just run out in the neighborhood, go to our neighbors, right. and on our own, ride the bike down the neighborhood. You have to, you know, parents have to kind of control their own anxiety about that and let the kids develop. Your goal, as I tell my parents, if you're a successful parent, your kids will leave you. When they are older, they will leave your house. That is your goal. You are trying to develop them into someone who wants to 
<laughs> go away and be on their own. <laughs> so you have to give them baby steps to get there. And the, the other piece that I want to get to, the fear of failure piece, um, is the construct that the society has kids in. Um, we've we've two subspecialized everything um, for kids. Everything's made in this pre-professional manner. So my son, who's inherently very athletic, because he's never played team sports, and is now going to be going to middle school. When we asked him if you want to play team sports, he's like, I can't. Like all the kids have been playing for six years, I'll yeah, look bad. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was in high school, I joined the tennis team because my friend did, I didn't, not because I played tennis. So um, there's some issues with too much structure by the adults, not letting them, the kids organize the activity, negotiate the activity with their peers, <coughs> figure out how to settle the dispute within the activity, and enjoy the activity for what it is, and select the activity. You know, how often do we see parents who are, who are driving the kid because they're you know, hoping for a college scholarship, or because they see the kid's talents and forget that most kids will burn out on whatever it is, whether it's their instrument or their sport, in three or four years, and they'll want to try something new, and then blocking that kid's opportunity to try something new, because, oh, you've invested four years into this into it, don't give up on it now. Mm -hmm. So being responsive to the kid and letting the kid guide their interests is important, mm -hmm. and supporting that is even more important, not letting them feel like they're a failure because they gave up the clarinet after four years, but say, I think that's great that you want to go try this mm -hmm. uh, new thing, sure. What you don't want to do is then giving up clarinet for 10 hours of Netflix every night, right? <laughs> you said, you're fine to give up clarinet, but you need to try okay. something different. Replace it with something else. So, um, you know, that, that's a, a parenting issue that's a challenge for a lot of people right now. And of course, you know, structurally, you know, when I was growing up, 30% uh, of households in the 70s had two parents working. That was flipped by the 90s. You know, only 30% of households had, uh, had um, I'm sorry, 70% of households had both parents working. Um, so, you know, parents are in a lot more pressure now um, and stress financially and trying to make everything happen and they have to shuttle kids to all these places. So, you know, we have to be empathic towards the parents. I mean, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. I'll add, I'm, uh, I'm the parent of a 16 year old and 17 in a, a week or two. Um, and I find that there's nothing stronger than um, positive um, peer support, and positive peer pressure. Um, I think surrounding yourself, these, these kids surrounding themselves with um, other, other kids who share their interests, uh, positive interests. Um, and for an example, I'll give my son's um, a wrestler for the high school team. Now, I don't know if you know these wrestlers, they're, they're obsessed with diet, health, weights. Um, so his kind of group, um, supports each other and it becomes a source of pride that their, you know, their interest is their health. Um, and I think that that is more than anything I could say to him is the, his group supporting each other, um, you know, to be interested in a healthy lifestyle is, um, is a huge thing. Can I, can I add something? Yes. Lots of parents come in and say to me, my kids are too young to do self-care. I have four-year-olds. They do yoga with me all the time. I know my, my, my twins and I are downward dog at the same time in the morning, a little crawling, but we go for family walks, we go to the Y together, we cook together. So just involving them in, in everything and helping them find their interests now and trying all different things, not being the helicopter parent on the playground, letting them climb up on the monkey bars and do those things. But they're never too young to start the self-care piece. Mom, why are we doing yoga? Because it keeps our bodies healthy. You know, and that's, why do we go to the gym? Well, that's the healthy place we go to. Yes, that's the healthy place we go to. So figuring that out, why are we getting fruits and vegetables from the grocery store? Why do we go to the farm together and pick those out? So it's never too young. They're never too young to figure, to start the healthy lifestyle. The other piece I would add, um, which is not talked about, is preserving sleep is critically important. I will 100% attest that the kids who stay up all night TV's in the bedroom, phones in the bedroom, function way, way worse in all aspects of life than kids who get enough sleep. Like, the sleep issue is a known issue. That's why the school system is trying to move the school time. It is a huge piece of what is going on with teenagers. And there's probably more screens in the bedroom, too, today than there were back when. Oh, sure. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. they're portable. Yeah. yeah. Um, so based on your professional experience, has any, has any of the prevention methods that were, you guys have talked about, has any of that evolved at all? Um, have you seen an evolution of it? Do we 
Do we know more? Do we know less? Do we, do we handle it differently? Well, I certainly think programs like this, right? Uh, that is definitely not something that was around in the 80s that I know of, right? And ta having these conversations, you know, I think it's really life or death nowadays, right? I mean, I don't know if kids were ODing in 1980 in Easton, I'm not sure, right? There was certainly drunk driving and whatnot, and we've lost a few people that way in high school, but you know, it's definitely more critical mass now that we have, so we have to have these conversations. We, we must address it. We can't pretend anymore that it's not a real problem. It's an epidemic. Um, so I think that that's where it starts, right? You have to identify the pain in order to fix what's going on, right? And so I think we've done a really good job um, of starting that conversation, and I think that mental health has just grown exponentially. Um, what I think in, in, we're gonna, the field is gonna grow by 25%, you know, in the next few years, right? So it's it's an area that there is a lot more um, opportunity for growth and teaching. And my master's is education, actually, and I, I believe I'm an educator. I, I teach people about relationships and feelings and, and emotional scuba diving is the word I like to, to use to describe it, right? And how to, you know, really be authentic within yourself. And I think that that's a driver in a lot of the conversations mm -hmm. that clinicians are having. So it's, I think people are getting more self-aware mm -hmm. and they're understanding the value and the importance of being self-aware. And so I'm hoping that we'll see, you know, big changes happening mm -hmm. over the next few years. I, I sort of feel like we're at the beginning of it at this point. There's a great resource I'd like to mention though. It's called um, naturalhigh.org and it's out of New Hampshire and it's a curriculum that's available to anybody who would like it and it's uh, videos from um, professional athletes, professional musicians, role models and mo mentors that speak to children uh, middle school and up and there's uh, question and answer worksheets, parents can discuss it, uh, schools can use it, it's free, um, a free curriculum available to everybody and it it speaks to positive psychology it speaks to helping kids um, find their purpose find their passion get excited about something you know find their drive um, to really live their best life and be their best self and to not be afraid to try things and to risk and uh, it's a wonderful resource we're hoping to actually run a program this summer um, for the kids over at Elevate in Easton um, because the videos are fabulous they're motivational and inspiring even to a middle-aged lady right <laughs> <laughs> so great resource anybody else want to jump in I would just add, I mean, there are more resources available for parents and families, I think, but just to reiterate on what we already said, I think the biggest resource that you can have is yourselves and the people here in the community. Um, it's pretty basic. Being involved, communicating, being consistent. I think, you know, there's lots of new resources, but you're you're the critical resource involved with your kids and your families. Right. Do you guys feel like stigma has, the this, this stigma is from where you, from where you sit is a stigma? Of substance use? Um, is it starting to get I think, a little well, lesser, maybe? <laughs> I think, um, no, I think the stigma is there. I, I, I do. I don't think that's, I don't think that's changed. I, I think the, um, I, I think people have to, and I say people, I think the communities in lar at large have to be mindful of history. Mm -hmm. Like, just say no does not work. That has been proven. Um, when you look at tobacco, the two, the only two proven effective uh, interventions were raising the taxes to price it out of people's reach, and um, and cutting out smoking in public places to make it mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. Like so, erecting community <coughs> barriers to access makes a difference. And um, you know, I think there's a lot of movement in that way. Like you know, having the drug take back programs are really great. I think people are more mindful about trying to get those medications out of their house. Uh, the prescribing. Um, rules in Massachusetts and other states have changed mm -hmm. uh, to allow for partial fills and prescriptions so you're not getting 60 pills of oxycodone. Uh, patients can elect to choose less. Uh, the prescribing practices have changed. 
you know, so some of that helps. Um, but on the flip side, now you have access to other things, you know. So, um, I mean, when I read that Mitch McConnell actually was <coughs> proposing a bill, that might be proposing a bill to raise the uh, federal tobacco well, age to 21, I nearly choked when I read that. I was surprised, <laughs> uh, especially coming from Kentucky. I was like, that's amazing, right? Um, Don't chase it. No, it's great. It's great. Because you know, it comes from a state that grows exactly. tobacco. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, we. We have lots of resources for families individually that need it, but truthfully, the problems have to be done legislated. That mm -hmm. had to be legislated. Um, you know, when Easton was kind of making decisions around whether to allow uh, recreational marijuana um, in town, and that was my concern was access. Like, you, you can talk to a kid, they're blue in the face, but you talk to we talk to our own kids, and they'll do things that they want to do sometimes because of other decisions and influences. And um, but if they don't have access to it's harder to make it happen. So I do think you know people are thinking more broadly. You really have to support um, you know, policies that help to restrict the ability for people to get their hands on addictive substances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I realized there was one uh, question that we didn't speak to, which I think is important, and that's the signs, like what, what to look for, or what are some of the concerning things that you might see in your child, and I think that um, the whole academic performance is a big one. Um, sudden changes in friend groups as well, if they're hanging out with different people. Um, they're not hanging out with people anymore. Um, their behavior has changed in terms of the way they're treating you, responding to you. Lack of engagement in the outside world if they're getting really isolated and going within or the opposite. They always want to be out and about and around. So like any sudden changes, in mood, behavior, friend group, right, disposition, and academic mm -hmm. performance, I think, are the big issues. Um, if that's happening, something is going on. Mm -hmm. My general rule of thumb, if anything is different than the normal. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Something is opposite for your child or your teen or, or, or another adult. If something is just different, something is going on, whether it's substance use or mental health mm -hmm. or, or, or traumatic event, but something, something is happening. Yeah, as a parent, it's okay to ask even if it's nothing because mm -hmm. children do evolve and change without anything going on, which can kind of keep us on our toes a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, but it's it's okay to ask those questions. You should ask those questions. That's just as a parent. For sure. So, yeah. yeah. Um, even, yeah. it might be nothing, but, you know, keep those lines of communication open just in case. So, does anybody have anything to add before I open it up to questions? Wait, one last question. This is, well, this is parents can ensure I, yeah, I think that yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah, the last question has pretty much been answered. I think it's about yeah getting the message across. <laughs> we talked a lot about getting the message across. So um, I wanted to open it up to to questions. Anybody might have questions from the audience for any of the panelists. I do. Um, I was wondering, you would, uh, Katie, you would mention resources that are available. I I find for me it's like really difficult at times to find the right resources and what I'm looking for to ask. You can have the most well-written pamphlet by marketing, mm -hmm. um, but it's not the right fit, so I need to do my homework. I was wondering what you have available for the resources, parents, and one that is raising up. There's a, so as far as like what they're, it is difficult, especially because they're talking in general, right? And you know your youth or whoever the person is you're concerned about. But um, the Search Institute that I talked about earlier and I brought some information, I can definitely give you my card before oh, these as well. Thank you. But they have um, a subsection of their website called, um, it used to be called Parent Further, it's now being called Keep Connected. Um, and that has um, information on all ages and stages of youth. Um, it has specific, I actually went on there before tonight just to kind of check, check, do my homework. And um, it has a lot of new information on substance abuse, but it also has kind of general parenting information too. So that's the whole ages and stages piece. Um, one of the really cool things on there, getting back to some of the things we were talking just talking to your kids, they had conversation starters, to, you know, game night, little activities you could do, depending on how engaged you want to be with the conversation. Um, but lots of different strategies and, and you know, not 
hey, here's a pamphlet, talk to your kid. Here's a way you can talk to your kid. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you the exact conversation and you, and you can decide, do you wanna ask all five questions or do you just wanna ask one question a week? So um, I can definitely provide you with that information before we do. Thank you, welcome. Another question. great way to talk to your kids, just kind of picking it off of Katie, is driving in the car because if they're behind you, they don't actually have to look at you. And a lot can be said for conversations while you're driving in the car. So just kind of finding the right opportunity and also letting them know that you want to talk to them because as parents, we have a plan that we're going to talk to our kid on Friday night at four o'clock about this topic and we're catching them off guard. So giving your child a heads up and the courtesy that you want to have this conversation so they can prepare how they want to have the conversation with you also. I think that is key. Yeah. You definitely can't plan with them. Yeah. <laughs> and it shows me, it shows me care and it shows them you're thinking about it. So they might not be ready, you might not necessarily, no one's ready, right? Um, but you know, you, whether you start it then or you start it later, it's important that they know. And, and that they have an equal voice then. Oh, mom gave me the courtesy to know that we're gonna have this conversation, I'm not gonna like it, but I have an equal voice in this conversation so I can have time to think about what I wanna say because she's already got her speech prepared. Anybody have any questions? So I have a question. Yep. Um, so you were late on being diagnosed okay, with um, anxiety. So we fictitiously had the first five years of school, um, typically. And then we had um, atypical ever since, so for six, seven, and eight. And so now we're having, so during the first five years of school, we were involved in drama, we were involved in different activities, um, loved and excelled in music and drama. And now, um, so now we're 14, we're in eighth grade, and um, re-entry is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So when you all were mentioning, um, the topic is how to prevent substance abuse in young folks, and you need to have them fully engaged but I'm struggling to have my team fully engaged because he was and then he wasn't and now he's back in society and there's no activity to engage him. So he is experimenting for the first time, unfortunately, and doing different things. So, so my question is, any examples of how to get him re- Engage. Re-engage in what he was doing before, or re-engage just in a new activity and how to kind of get develop that new strength, like we was talking well, about. Or, sorry, I just need a little bit more. Sure. Okay. We engage in society. We were at a therapeutic school, so we kind of just lived in that world. Gotcha. And so we gotcha. caught up with the school for the whole day, and then we came back home in the evenings. But our evenings were in our rooms, they weren't yep. out in society. Yep. Um, and so now we're back at the public schools. Yep. And so it's, um, we don't have an activity. Less structure, there's not everything that's planned for you. Right, well, the, the, the high school, uh, the middle school is structured, mm -hmm. um, but it's just getting him like a, a social structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did, I helped yeah. one. Yes, yeah. 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 I'm with her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the, it's a struggle. Reintegrating a child into a school when they've been absent for a long time is extraordinarily stressful for any kid, yeah. whether they're for any reason. Yeah. Uh, and, and people don't think about that. You know, a kid who's had a behavioral problem in school gets suspended for a week. You're you're basically setting themselves up for a bad behavior when they get back because of the, all that week. There are all the things are how am I going to face the other my kids? What they ask me this? How am I going to deal with that? Right? And and they've already chosen non-effective modes of behavior to deal with that <laughs> but that's their that's their default so it, it's not easy I, I think from the school standpoint you got to work with the guy you know the adjustment counselors and the, and the school personnel a little bit uh, with it every kid's different so their needs are different but it also speaks I think to like programs like the Y and having programs outside of school when, when your child's whole life is embodied within the school in the same social circle school, the same kids for their sports teams, the same, it's it's really difficult for a kid when they feel different, whether it's for something like that, whether it's because their sexuality they feel is different, anything. I'm a huge advocate for summer camps, huge, because 
you need to, kids need to find their own space. And when we live in a town, and this is the school, this is not by their choosing, this is the space we chose for them. Right. And so, um, looking outside of your community to find a space right. for a kid like that is enormous, I think. Looking <laughs> back, like, yeah. so I'm the middle, um, my nurse at the middle school when I've been with Wings of Hope since right. 2015. And um, I've actually uh, been in Easton since, I had both of your yeah. kids, um, since 2008. And, yeah, like looking back at this type of situation, I do see that kids do better when they go to an outside camp or like a music camp that isn't with the peers that they had in fourth and fifth and sixth grade. And it's not convenient because, you know, I, I was trying to think of my brain about like what programs are out there. And sometimes where we live, I find if you're not a sports kid or like a jazz band kid, it's really hard, you know. Um, and sometimes like you have to look outside. So I was really interested in, in hearing about like getting your kind of looking into some of your programs. And um, at the same time, I was also like, oh, with budget cuts and stuff coming up, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, like all these things, because you like to have a varied amount of clubs, so you have different things, but you also want to have varied experiences so kids can do the stuff. And sometimes it's hard if you're with all the kids that you don't maybe like at your school or in in that case so um, I do have had some parents who have done like the summer camps which I was I've never done a summer camp but the, the, the kids end up thriving um, like that PCC camp yeah. is really good because it's they're at Stonehill but it's kids from all over and not yeah. necessarily all Eastern so they can kind of go there they're down the street from us and um, but they get a new, a new a fresh, a real fresh start. Yeah, no, you know? I think I think there's value. In that. It does, and you have to look out. You have to look outside the box. You have to look outside the box a bit, but you have to do it where you're. Like obviously, I could never commute anywhere long, but it's it's different. I can look at a couple of things. I'm really yeah. interested to hear about your program. And I'd be happy to speak with you after yeah. to talk a little bit just about your personal experience and what the why could either could and offer. It's, it's safe for the kids. Different programs. Okay. It's safe for the kids to practice in a group that they don't see every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So if your child, like theater, there's tons of theater programs around that aren't in Easton, that are, right. aren't nearby, that they can yep. practice with, um, like short-term one-week camps, so it's not committing to an entire summer, but the very short thing, but the Y has a ton of, of great structure programs in there. They are really good about catering to everybody's individual needs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how old your child is, but that... 14. Yeah, so that's still an appropriate age for mm -hmm. camp. Which camp is a good yeah. example? Because there's a lot of are usually pretty good before, like you know, like you know, four, you know, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. You kind of start. To, uh, they're gonna want to do their own things, but I find like fourteen. Well, well, our camps, we we, we, we cater up to start. fifteen. Yeah. We actually have leadership programs, yeah. for, which would be a potential really good match for um, the older youth. Um, but yeah, I mean, what I was gonna say is they they get to experience a lot of different activities within camp, so they can mm -hmm. develop that strength or that spark that they, you know, they do a half hour of archery and then they do, you know, some swimming so that if, you know, they don't have to be perfect at, you know, sports or whatever that exact activity is, they get a lot of different exposure. And, so. and I would add, but the Y runs programs like this throughout the year, so you, made, you could, in the test club, I mean, you could do six weeks of this, four mm -hmm. weeks of that, so there's not this sense that kids do, they have to, you're on the travel team for the next six right. months and, and you're right. stuck. Yeah. So, you know, the mm -hmm. opportunity for kids to dabble a little bit and to be with different groups of people that don't know them so they don't bring, they don't have to yeah. worry about all the baggage they bring with them is enormously yeah. Yeah. relieving know, for I, a kid. I find yeah. a lot of time kids are there, because it, it's age appropriate for them to be worried about what's going on. It, but with teens, they get hyper-focused on it. So it's, it's, it's a long process with the reintegration and things like that. But um, I do think um, I'm really interested in hearing about all your activities because I'd love to know how to be able to direct parents to some different resources. Mm -hmm. And um, the Y has always been great too with us, like um, with Sarah, like I know, um, you know, if I, I need to get somebody to the gym or whatever mm -hmm. has always been great because sometimes financially um, in Easton people think, oh, it's this, you know, upper class, but we have a lot of needs yeah. too still yeah. out there. And especially if there is like um, 
a home where a parent is struggling as well. You know, um, not everybody has like a two-parent, really involved household that's able to help. Yeah, and I think the statistics, I think 40% of our student population is on free and reduced lunch. Is that yeah. about right? I, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. When we first started doing the um, free breakfast, yeah. they were like, oh, I don't know if we'll be successful. 40 kids every day. Yeah. I'm like, oh my god, yeah, we're really 40 kids eating, you know yeah. what I mean, before. But it's definitely way more than... Okay. The, the other thing I would add, and this is not kind of culturally true in the United States, but when I went to New Zealand for a year, it was very different. Um, we tend to focus that you have to be with people your same age. Right. And mm -hmm. you know, we forget that like kids get something out of being with people of different ages, including right. adults of different ages. Right. And yeah. opportunities to go do activities with people who are older is a good mm -hmm. thing. Um, you could take your kids, you can volunteer at, um, oh my God, what's the, uh, Stair Stonehill with my brother's, my brother's, brother's keeper. keeper. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah, more where you see people doing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the adults love having kids around. Um, they love talking to them. They engage the kids. It's a compassionate environment. Like there's other ways to engage kids. And honestly, when the kids, all the stress is coming from their peer group, sometimes it's good to find things that involve adults. Um, and it may be a club. It could be cooking. It could mm -hmm. be whatever. Mm -hmm. So. I, I'm a big believer in that. I was I was struck when I was in New Zealand, like when I, w I joined the tennis club and we would play tennis. It was literally eight to eighty, and it was just uh -huh. everyone would play together. And I'm like, this is the way it really, mm -hmm. realistically, should be in a community like this. You know, like there's not there's not enough people. To say. <laughs> you can only have. So you know, I, I think kids, some kids are old souls and they do better around older kids. Some kids are younger than their state age and struggle with their peer group because they're a little bit immature and do better with younger kids. Mm -hmm. And knowing your kids, it, it helps um, to think about that a little bit. Anybody else have any questions? Nope. <laughs> One thing I was wondering if okay. you had any ideas is um, uh, how could, what are your suggestions for engaging the younger population, you know, not just at school, but how could we do more with like, you know, like getting like the, the parents of like, um, you know, school age, preschoolers, like starting with this early so that it's not all of a sudden when we're in, you know, middle and high school having an issue. Do you have any ideas about how, um, you know, we could offer some more educational opportunities or? So I'm a parent of four girls. Um, I do a lot of social stories and my children get a lot of the, the emotion books, but any kind of play or books that kids are coloring pages around that type of information is really good for the younger mm -hmm. preschool age kids. Well, what about how to get the parents involved? So like to say, hey, you know, um, we, this, this is going to be an issue later on in life, but these are some skills you will need now. Or later on down the road. I think we just keep trying. I think there are some preschool parents who really get it and want to hit it off at the right. head, especially if they have older kids, and some who are, I think, like any age parent, but not my kid. It's not going to happen to my household, and I think that happens no matter what age. So I think we just we just give them the information like we do to all of our kids. This is mm -hmm. more information. Here are resources for you. Here's a kit. We're encouraging you to try them with your family. Mm -hmm. I think we just keep putting it out there and we keep trying. It's, I think we're going to have the same problem with preschool parents that we are going to have with the high school parents mm -hmm. with the, the oh, lack of engagement. Yeah. Or, or yeah. positive yeah. engagement. Yeah. I would also, I mean, the Y is happy to team up on anything with the schools that's interested in educating families and pr whether it's providing space or trainers or, so I, th I do agree with Marcy, you got to keep trying, but there's lots of different resources out there to provide parents, I think. You know, it's the messaging. It's and it, I mean, people are here tonight. You know, there it shouldn't. The number doesn't necessarily have to matter. It's the impact people are going to leave tonight. Tell another person what they learned. Share the story. Share the resource. So it, you just got to keep doing it. Yeah, I think it's not like on my parent, like on my kid, like with younger kid. Like I, you know, I, the the question of like talking to my kids about this stuff that young mm -hmm. didn't seem like we needed to yet. Right. You know what I mean? So it's not as Sometimes it's a not my kid. We definitely have that in every town, but but it's also like okay, these aren't conversations. That, but it's how I think it's how to frame the conversations right. for the young, like you were saying, this, the social emotional yep. the books and, and the words. Like how to we frame be, it for the younger kids. We want to be healthy. We want to yeah. we want to live a long life. We want to have lots of energy. Mm -hmm. We want to be safe. We want to use our bodies and and good. Like, like we're saying, like you know, nice hands just kind of keeping with whatever their terminology is. Should be the same, I mean, it's 
National Substance Abuse Month. It should be the same way. I mean, sorry, Child Abuse Month. And we talk about child abuse differently than we used to years ago. So you have to think about it in that context too. You're not afraid, anybody, I don't know how many parents of young children, you're not afraid to say, no one should touch you there. No one, should, you know, that's your body. So the same kind of stuff. It's just, so it's shifting the messaging mm -hmm. to substance abuse. Yes. Way. Thank you. I, mean, I agree with, you know, taking the role on as a parent. And not, I, I mean, I've always done that, but why can't it be taught in schools like to educate these kids because i'm telling you like when they do get older it's almost like i'm the lucy in the peanuts teacher my kids are like but if it's like in the schools and i'm not sure what age i'm not a teacher and you know i mean you do these programs and it's wonderful but if it's in the schools and you know you have breast cancer month you have this and that why aren't these kids being educated at a younger age? Why do we have to sign off as parents? Yeah, you shouldn't be taught this. I mean, marijuana billboards are everywhere. It's legal. My son read it the other day. Oh, you know, he's 16, going to be 17. He's very curious. These kids are curious. And if they knew what their vaping is doing to them, truly doing to them, because I know they're fearless, their brains aren't developed, and God forbid the male is, you know, we want to wait till my son's 26 to yep. so have a human again, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so how do we get to that point to get it in the schools? You know, because we actually do that, yeah. Cam. We have it more than ever, and it's, it's evolving, and it's a process. And um, it actually, I'm really excited because the, um, the head of wealth, uh, wealth health <laughs> and wellness now is K to 12. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I know that as uh, a parent and a health, and I actually have my master's in health education that I've been pushing for. We can't do anything, like we, we can do things, but we shouldn't just focus on the high school or the middle school for that matter. But, and I will have to say that um, both, you know, Dr. Corral and um, Christy Crook have been very supportive. And um, they actually had, so Corinne um, McCarthy, she's the head of um, the, so she's a department head, and she has all the health teachers and, um, and phys ed teachers, and they're slowly integrating mm -hmm. all that into that role as well. So there are positive steps being made in that. K to five, we're working on that, and they have a new program called the Great Body Shop. And the pilot, and it's awesome because it's, it's not just don't, you know, a drug substitute, it's healthy body, whole child approach. And uh, it starts at kindergarten. And, you know, but unfortunately, I do think that things happen. Teachers have a lot to do. Right. And, you know, we, we're actually, you know, we're coming up on budget cuts. I'm not, I, you know, we finally got a health teacher. I really need that to stay. We fought for the health teacher in high school for a long time. Because you know they need they need health, okay. And I think some of the involvement of the phys ed teacher is going to take on that role. Mm -hmm. But at that time, at the same time, you know our kids. I think they have phys ed well maybe two times a week when they're little, yeah, and then it goes up to when they're you know um, every other day when they're in high school and at I mean in middle school. And now they're actually having to have health and wellness classes um, through twelfth grade, which it used to just be ninth and tenth. So I do see things in there. And I, I'm speaking both as a parent and somebody on the front lines. Right, right. You know, and even a lot of this stuff as that I've gone in, not as like, you know, like I wish for. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, and yeah. I do see it and I feel really positive about it, but it's just hard because like the, the issues keep growing and keep, right. you know, like, I mean, and try to keep up with the state requirements as well. They, they, right. They're constantly changing and they're constantly evolving and the, the schools are constantly playing catch up to try and keep up with what it is the state now is requiring a teacher to do or to have the certification they need to have right. and all this other like stuff on top as of it. parents, we're just catching yeah. up on the vaping. Exactly. Schools going to be like yeah. four years yeah. behind yeah. in catching up with that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thank, thankfully we have Lynn LeBlanc is also on, on the Wings of Hope Board, and she is very involved in the wellness clubs now, but we are looking at, you know, getting to the younger ages and not just keeping it like high school and middle school. So just right. like one quick comment, I know today at the middle school, I'm not sure if it's the entire middle school, just the eighth graders, I know we had a discussion on um, alcohol, which was, which was really good. Um, so my son came home, he does have a disability, and he said, Mom, we had a conversation today in assembly on alcohol and the uses of it, check. 
um, but I didn't understand because it was talking, you know, a oh, lot about um, uh, uh, medical or, or mm -hmm. how it, it affects was, the brain. Uh, Dr. Sayon Harris, we did, they, it was, so this is a different one, it, but they went into the brain chemistry of it, and so it was, we went into what you yeah. talked about with Igon, and, and we actually had, should we had to speak in September, Dr. Sion Harris. So this was about brain health, and it went into the synapses and how using substances can affect your brain. And, um, you know, it, 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 when you go to, there is no one assembly that uh, the kids are going to 100% like, but well, what's going to happen with this assembly is there is going to be, there was pre-teaching done, and there's also going to be follow-up done. And the kids are going to be out filling out and asking questions. So he's going to have the opportunity if he didn't have, if he didn't um, understand something to ask them. And we're going to also send something up to the parents with a link with Dr. Harris. Okay. And what is also great is that it's going to be a continuum. We're also going to use, we're, so we're doing a program that is also going to go into ninth grade. Because what Corinne and I discussed is that, you know, the summer between eighth and ninth grade is just, that's You're going from a middle school to a high school, okay. and it's just it's you know a change in environment. You know the you know the, the high school is set up for everybody in 12th grade, so the kids have to adjust. So we're trying to transition that, but there's also going to be a parent piece too, okay. which a lot of times you know we just have speakers and that's it. It's done. So there's going to be a follow-up piece. Um, I sat through it today and I loved it, and I didn't just love it because I understood that they were saying. But I'll tell you, you could do is not a pin dropped through there. That was like the first thing. If we weren't having to run around and, you know, tell people to be quiet, that it was, but they did. They were right. That's great that he actually talked about it, though. Because yes. it resonated. Because it was a lot yes. about marijuana yes. and um, vaping, too. Because it was talked about how when you use things at a younger age, it's going to increase the risk of um, um, addiction. And it also talked about the delay, delay, delay principle. Where you know, you know, any substance use you want to delay until you're older, you know, if at all older, because the brain is still yeah, developing. Let me put that first. Having having done those talks to seventh graders, the goal is not to suddenly endow them with knowledge. Right. right. The right. goal is just to simply make them stop and think for like, a moment right. and question and ask questions right. and understand it's okay to ask questions. These are taboo subjects. Like they, these are not questions. They're generally going to feel comfortable talking to parents. And you know, when I've given these talks to kids, I had questions come back. We usually had a, my sister would have them write down the questions. Everything from like, so you mean Dunkin' Donuts is making everyone addicted? Because yeah. <laughs> I know. So you have real life indignity over uh, Dunkin' Donuts. But you know, to to something more serious. So so what is you know, you know GHB? You know, like mm -hmm. I've heard of this. What is this? You know, what does it do? So you're right. Every kid's in a different level. But what what is effective when you talk? I find to kids straight. Like you're just giving them honest information. You're not giving them directives. Right. You're not giving them judgment. You're just giving them information. That's when you see what their concerns are. That's when you see where they're operating on, like wh where their brain is at. And that's when there's an opportunity to have that conversation for you, to have a conversation on your son's level, whereas some other parent will have a conversation on, on a different level with their kid. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the drug education misfired in the 80s. It was too prescriptive, it was mm -hmm. top down, and it wasn't a, do addressing this. where the kid was at mm -hmm. and letting the kid have a piece in the conversation to address their own questions and concerns. So I think the problem that I wanted yeah. to highlight um, has to be um, piggybacking on um, Mr. Evans. There is a, there should be more of a connect um, in terms of education and awareness around uh, psychiatric um, uh, illnesses or, or disorders and that of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. So because of our disability, having this um, lecture today was great overall, but because of our disability, there still remains at the end of the day a disconnect. So mm -hmm. in terms of educating and, aware, and, and, and making parents and students more aware, I think it definitely needs to be done um, Definitely an assembly, so no one can singled out. Mm -hmm. But then definitely it needs to be broken down to the different types of groups mm -hmm. um, that we serve, especially 
at the high school, mm -hmm. um, with, I'm sorry, at the middle school, where we have students um, in the TLC center, mm -hmm. students with varying disabilities. So it, it just has to be broken down to, to a smaller level. I was excited, yeah. but, mm -hmm. but it, it just highlights like the point that there, there is a disconnect. When you see those that are on, that are disabled, more apt to yeah. try the substance. And how can we, as parents or, or a group, um, try to prevent, if we can, I think it's just in how we present the information. You have to remember, too, I mean, it, it's all well good to think that in every situation you have stable parents, stable right. home, parents who are concerned, parents who have the cognitive ability to understand. That's not true. Right. Um, so, you know, this is a multi faceted problem and um, the schools cannot solve it for everyone yeah. um, you know the goal ideally would be to find you know find people kids who are at risk so you know I'm a pediatrician so our, our goal is preventive care you know you try to identify the kids who are at risk and try to give resources or give information to help mitigate that risk um, so I, I think that you know the goals are when you see kids young kids, I mean like toddlers who have behavioral problems at three and four that you know, maybe this is going to be someone who's got ASD, maybe there's um, issues of attachment in the household, maybe there's an issue with a parent who's got depression, you know, the, the opportunity to intervene younger makes a big difference down the line. I, I mean, it's everything about brain development says young, 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 zero to three, <laughs> you know, so, so the supports you can give, you know, community-wise can give to parents who have kids that young, preschool in the town. Uh, uh, full day kindergarten yeah. uh, goes a long way to helping the things. Um, removing barriers for opportunities for that, positive opportunities for kids. Fees for sports make me cringe for the high school kids. Like it makes me cringe to think that a kid wouldn't be able to participate because they can't afford it. Um, that that's a barrier potentially for a kid being engaged in a positive activity. Um, so you know, being mindful about the. You know what affects families. Earlier intervention matters um, the most, and um, and then identifying people at risk and trying to get them services early, so that parents struggling with their four-year-old, you know, has someone who can give some parenting help, would make a big difference. I think. So I know that I am not on the panel, but I think I just <laughs> I wanted to give some perspective. I have, I'm a mom of twin ten-year-olds and a two-year-old. Um, and I think having served on multiple substance abuse prevention, so, you know, coalitions, and VP of program development, medical colony, why, um, and just sort of from parenting to professional experience, when dealing, not dealing, sometimes dealing, working with a toddler, that being honest, and I think what I learned personally and what has worked for me and what I try to share with others is there's three things that I focus on with children age two. One is the first substance they struggle with is sugar. Yes. And we as parents, kind of screw that up on a really regular basis and we reward with sugar and we coach with sugar and we bribe with sugar and trying to figure out sort of how to get that under wraps and I think the Y has great things with regards to their HEPA curriculum, healthy eating and physical activity standards and just how we even talk about sugar. I think we see marijuana marketing and tobacco marketing and so I started talking about marketing with my children. I don't care that those gummies have a princess on them. It does not mean that it's good for you. You know, exactly. They know that you like that, sweetie, and so it's on the box. And so I once found my kids counting how many candy commercials there were between their shows that they were watching. And they came to my husband and I and said, Mom, there were eight candy commercials, and that's all they're showing us. And they were like, that's really gross that they're doing that to children. My kid was five when they put two and two together. You know, and I think, you know, the third is just medication. And I was talking to my two-year-old yesterday, you know, Parker, your older sister's medication might be medicine, but it doesn't mean it's healthy for you. Medicine is different for other people, and I think... You know, it's not substance abuse prevention necessarily directly, but those conversations are super easy to have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and to like break it down into those three buckets. I've just found it's digestible for parents. There's some clear talking points there. Sugar marketing and medicine. <laughs> you know, that's my two cents. <laughs> Hey, those are all excellent, by the way. Thank you. The media, the media literacy is super important. Yeah. yeah super important. And that is something that should be taught through schools. And was, at least when my daughter was in third or fourth grade, they started doing a little bit of that. Yeah. yeah. That needs to be taught in schools. And, yeah. and that goes beyond substance. That's just yeah. knowing what's yeah. truth yeah. and yeah. fiction. Yeah. Right. Um, 
the the other thing um, is about um, dopamine and the sugar rush. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, all addictive substances functionally work through dopamine at some level. Um, the the real epidemic amongst kids is boredom. Like kids freak out. I'm bored. I'm bored. I'm bored. Like. My mom used to say, you're not bored, you're boring. Like, go find something to do. Uh, which I think is a great phrase, right? Like, all creative things happen out of boredom. When our brains are quiet, that's when creative thought happens. Mm -hmm. Like, there needs to be, parents need to get their kids comfortable with the concept of being bored. Yeah. Like, it is so unbelievably critical. The first thing a parent does in my office when the kid's feeling rest is hand on the phone yeah. to quiet them. You, you have to, parents need to resist that impulse and say, find something to do, think whatever you want to do. Like, you need to unleash the kid's creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but they become so reliant on something that's instant to settle them as soon as they feel uncertain that that is an addictive kind of moment, right? So that's exactly what you're talking about with anxiety. Like, I need something right now. I had a parent call me because the kid was going to have surgery the next day. and. He's really anxious about it. He, you know, can you prescribe? Said, no, I mean, you can talk with the anesthesiologist, but I'm not going to give you something that might interfere with the anesthesia. That's not safe. And yes, your child should be anxious about having surgery. So maybe you should just talk about it. Like, it's okay. Like, that's a normal response. That's, you're a human being if you're feeling You would not be normal if you're not feeling anxious. When, when the kid's worried about getting a shot, I always joke, my parents are like, oh, they're so scared of shots. I'm like, that's why I get the kids like, oh, I'm bumped, I'm not getting a shot. I'm like, okay, that's weird. <laughs> like, that's not normal, right? So. So like we have to we have to forget like anxiety is normal like it's okay right I have to tell parents like you want your kid to feel anxious you want your kid to feel depressed sometimes but it should be you know within boundaries of like normal situation and with boundaries of like not functionally impairing um, and you need to let them live with those emotions a little bit and not try to run away from it all the time and and I think you know when you talk about escapism and escaping the drugs a lot it's just not being comfortable with yourself and so for the young kids yeah. Go find something to do. Like that's yeah. the best thing a parent could say. Yep, I'm busy. Go find something yeah. to play with. Like that is perfect parenting advice. Yeah. Yep. So I just want to thank the panelists very much for their time and their insight and their input. Um, and I think that everybody probably has cards and things like yes. that if they want to touch base with some of these members here and for follow up questions and things. And there are a few snacks in the bag if anybody wants to grab a bag of chips and pencils for the road and water. And, and stress balls. And stress balls. Yeah. <laughs> you guys you gotta feel your feels, right? So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.